Dr. Naif is well known figure for all of you, I think. He's an atomic physicist renowned for his uh, groundbreaking work in nanotechnology. He received his BSc and MSc from the American University of Beirut and his PhD from Stanford University. He is currently a professor at the University of Illinois. He has chaired and served as advisor on numerous panels of the major institutions involved in nanotechnology. Dr. Nafi co-authored Electricity and Magnetism, co-edited three books on laser technology, and is the author of the book of Fundamentals and Applications of Nanotechnology, Silicon in, plasto in Plasmonics and Fourier rates. He presents science fiction stories using trademarks, Dr. Nano, to simplify nanotechnology for children. In the field of nanotechnology, Dr. Nafi has developed breakthrough imprints by developing detection and writing of single atom on surface. Dr. Nafi holds a lar largest number of patents in nano silicon worldwide, 30, 23 US, Europe, 22 Asia. He is founder, chief officer of the three nanotechnology companies and has been the president of the network of Arab scientists and technologists abroad. Dr. Nafi will talk about nanotechnology, innovation in health care from lab to consumers. Dr. Nafi, please. Thank you for this uh, beautiful and kind words, Dr. Abdullah. And uh, so um, we don't waste the time. I want to share my slides. Start. Sharing. Do you see my slides? Yeah. Okay. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Wa masa al khair. Wa Ramadan Kareem. Wa inshaAllah. Eid will come soon uh, when, uh, while uh, the corona is gone. So we can see you uh, very soon, person to person. Do you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. So I, I am going to uh, discuss with you uh, some innovations of how nanotechnology can be used, the, the principles, the science behind the concepts of why uh, nanoscience and technology can be helpful in the bio uh, and especially the medical field. First, I would like to uh, enter, give thanks and celebrations for several occasions. One is that the building, the permanent site is finished and thanks to Dr. Abdul Salam. Here, when I visited while the construction was going on, and here uh, with Dr. Abdul Salam uh, during one of his visits to Chicago and Champaign. The second thing which we should be excited about is that the 35, uh, 35th anniversary of the uh, Academy is coming up and uh, for the meeting in Rabat. And remember that the very first was held in Amman under the uh, patronage of His Royal Highness Prince Al Hassan with President Zia Ul Haq from Pakistan. And also the 25th anniversary was celebrated in Qatar. And here uh, uh, many of the faces you would know, Dr. Uh, all over. And the third celebration is what I call a Nano Summer Festival. 
And this is the beginning of it. And thanks to Dr. Abdullah's energy and Dr. Adnan Badran for putting us together in this series, which is bringing speakers uh, familiar to us from the USA, uh, myself, South Africa, Jordan, and China. And from Jordan, of course, Dr. Uh, Ala Eddin, who is an alumni of the University of Illinois, where I met him in my office uh, here in Champaign. So he's going to uh, talk about uh, gold nanorods and how it can be used in medicine. And of course, Dr. Zhao uh, from China, also a familiar to me as I visited their center uh, a few years back. I would like to tell you why I'm excited about nanotechnology. There are three sentences I can tell you. First, that there, it attracted billions of dollars, attracted thousands of scientists and engineers like us, and it is considered the technology of the 21st century. It enters everything. Second, it is beyond nature because nature has not produced uh, in free space the nanomaterials we are going to be talking about. And it challenges us, the limits of engineering and precision uh, and our concepts of uh, man-made engineering. And the third is that, uh, as we were talking uh, earlier before the session started, that this nanotechnology has attracted the imagination of the young and old both at the same time. And, uh, and because it appeals to everyone, because it has the potential to solve many of the problems that face the human race. So there is something for everyone. And uh, this uh, nanotechnology, in order to understand how uh, it helps us uh, health-wise, uh, we start with Richard Feynman. He is a theoretical physicist, a famous one, Nobel laureate. In 1959, December, uh, he uh, sort of digressed from his theoretical uh, uh, know-how to experimental by saying that uh, instead of manufacturing things through old fashioned chemical means, why don't we uh, start back with the atoms, how nature started or the universe started at some point. So these are the atoms, uh, it's a cartoon. And he said, let's start taking one atom at a time and build things. Uh, this is a structure, that's another structure, here's another structure. And we could keep doing that till we build a car or build a house or build whatever. He's a theoretical physicist, but he sort of missed a couple of things. First of all, how can I produce these atoms? Because atoms usually are associated with others and they're connected in solids and in, in uh, it's hard to get at. So you still have first to go back to work to get them separated from each other, then assemble them. The second thing is very slow. Each, each atom, if you consider a car or even the smallest tool you have at home, it has uh, uh, you know, almost Avogadro number type of number of atoms. And if each process would take a fraction of a second, that's infinite time. At the time he was here in Pasadena, Southern California. And in 1959, I was in prep school in Albira, Ramallah. Here's some of the photos, a lot of hair. We were talking about hair, a lot of hair. And 10 years later, I landed in, at Stanford here not too far from Pasadena. After I stopped at the American University of Beirut where I did my undergrad. And the, how the luck worked that Richard Feynman 
came to Stanford to give a seminar the way we are now giving seminars and discussing things. So I attended the talk after the, I was brand new there. After uh, his uh, trip to Stanford, uh, Rich Arthur Shallow, who's also a Nobel laureate, he is credited to the invention of the laser. Theoretically, he did not build a laser, but he, with Richard Towns, his brother-in-law, they figured out how the laser worked, brought us students in his office. And he said, listen, Richard Feynman says uh, we can build uh, atom at a time and this. And then he said uh, he knows that there is some problem with this concept, because how can we do atom at a time if we cannot see the atoms? Because in 1970, believe it or not, or 69, 70, people didn't have a means to see atoms individually. How can you move them if you don't see them? And he said, there is an opportunity for us, his lab, to enter into this area by at least helping him or helping the concept of seeing atoms. That was the idea. So he, uh, we were a few uh, new graduate students, first year graduate students, who said, uh, who's going to work on hydrogen? Who's going to work on sodium? Who's going to work on something else? I said, I will work on hydrogen. My friend, Fairbank Jr., he said he'll work on sodium. And so the idea was, because shallow is into lasers, you take a laser, you shine it on the, a group of atoms, and after that, light comes out, fluorescence. So you count how many photons came out. You calibrate, you do, then you say, these are a hundred, a thousand, a million atoms. Uh, the other idea is that you shine the light on the atoms and you see how much light has been absorbed. You don't worry about how many photons came out, how many photons were absorbed. And you calibrate and, and uh, you figure out the density or how many your laser beam was interacting with. In the hydrogen experiments, we use absorption. To my dismay, at the end, I figured out that I saw a thousand atoms, not, a, not one. My friend, colleague, he saw a hundred sodium atoms. So he did better than. But it turns out hydrogen was much more important than sodium. And through the measurements of hydrogen, we were able to get uh, the lamp shift optically. We were able to measure the fine structure of hydrogen, which people teach in textbooks, the hyperfine structure we, calculate, we, we measured. Uh, we measured the Rydberg constants, which is the cornerstones of all fundamental constants. We improved its resolution by uh, more than an order of magnitude. And so, in fact, the, the, the thesis work was uh, included in the highlights of the 100 years of physical review in the United States and worldwide. So it was picked as a seminal uh, result. At that time, the people, the, the, there was some action at Pasadena where he is, at Stanford and at MIT in 1976, an undergrad student started to think about these concepts. And then I moved to Oak Ridge, I got my first job. There was some theory that helped us in the hydrogen measurements from Moscow. Now I went to Oak Ridge and I, told them the story that Shallow told us about Feynman. So they got excited and they said, we want to improve the resolution and the sensitivity. The Oak Ridge National Laboratory is where the atomic bombs were manufactured and thrown at Japan. So they were naturally, they were interested in ionization. How does the, the uh, radiation from uh, a nuclear uh, attack would ionize cells and molecules in a human body and create cancer. So they were experts on ionization. So the idea came that instead of shining a laser and measure the absorption, 
as I did at Stanford, or measure the fluorescence as my uh, colleague did, we said, let's in fact follow the ionization. And so the laser was uh, made more intense. So it's like it took two photons and it produced an electron and an ion instead of a photon. So either you absorb a photon or you see a photon, or now you break the atom into an electron and an ion and you go after one of them. And it turns out ionization, it's easier to measure an electron charge than a photon at the time. Now we have got better resolution and sensitivity on measuring photons, but at the time it was the ionization. So we built that device, a proportional counter or a Geiger's counter. We teach these things in undergrad physics nowadays. And so at that time, therefore, the groups around the world that had any action about Feynman's concept is Pasadena, Stanford, Oak Ridge, and MIT. So that was the idea. And it turns out that the extra sensitivity bought us some improved analytical detection. And so we were able to bring down not only a hundred atoms, but one atom, a single atom, and it was cesium. Now cesium is like sodium, uh, one of those uh, in the same series, but cesium turns out nowadays atomic clock and it has its own, but it's more explosive. It's harder to work with, but that was the demonstration. And then the news media exploded after the result came out. Of course, Physics Today wrote articles with pictures, the, sci the sciences, the encyclopedias, every magazine laser focus, nuclear news, chemical news, industrial news, newspapers, Washington Post, in Germany, in many languages, uh, because this is the ultimate sensitivity in material analysis. But there's a problem with this, is that it's in a gas phase, gas. And so in 19, that was in 1977 the result came, but in 1982, the concept of ionization was pushed further. So instead of using a laser to ionize the atoms, now we use a metal tip, a sharp tip, metal tip, a sort of an object, and we put the atom over an object, so a substrate, we bring a needle and we let the needle pull the electrons out from the atom. But you, in order to pull it, you have to get, unlike the laser, you could shine it from a kilometer away. This step has to be as close as one atom, almost touching the atom before it can uh, pull an electron out. And indeed, when you scan the needle over the surface, uh, every time you go over an atom, it's easier to pull an electron. Between atoms is harder. And so by plotting the current or the number of electrons being pulled, or as a matter of fact, being pushed, either way it works because you think of it as the opposite, holes being pulled, then uh, you can plot the atoms on a surface. So this is becoming more practical. And uh, at, at this time, many groups exploded. Everybody's trying. I went from uh, Urbana Champagne to uh, London to buy a device like this with a needle. And I bought it and it was the second manufactured around the world commercially. And I bought it and brought it to Urbana uh, with a grant from the US Navy. So at, the, at that time, uh, an exponential growth in uh, uh, scanning uh, microscopy, tunneling microscopy. 
1986, another leap or another stride came along, which is instead of seeing the atoms with the needle, now I want to use the needle to move atoms on the surface. That was another uh, step. And to manipulate, either remove or put. And it was easy uh, after you know the, the concept, it's like uh, what you see uh, people doing on the street, uh, uh, the, the caterpillar, they bring uh, something, they uh, fill, they take dirt and remove it from one place and put it in another. So you think of a tip, it's so small, you see how the diameter of it is as large as an atom. Here's an atom on a surface. You bring the tip close enough, and when it gets close, you touch mechanically or electronically or chemically. You know, every material or uh, uh, has a different mechanism. And you attract this atom, and then you take the tip away, just like what happens on the street, move to another spot and then release by the opposite of what you've done. And so you can build, you can put different things. Here's an example where the Japanese, this is a silicon surface. The white is silicon atoms. This is silicon atom, that's silicon atom. They moved enough atom to write the word peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, 91 H-C-R-K, that's their lab name. And that was the Gulf War, during the Gulf War, 91. Here is IBM, where they put on a surface, very cold surface, xenon atoms. Xenon is usually flies out, it's gas. They put it, they froze the surface, and they brought the tip, and they start pushing atom, atom, and they wrote approximately IBM, the name of their company. This is very cold, so it's not very useful. This is at room temperature. In my lab, I took some aluminum atoms. Now we're getting close to manufacturing uh, electronic devices because aluminum is used in devices, metal for contacts. We took some molecules and some atoms and put them on a graphite surface. Here's another example of a silicon surface where we drilled a hole, a line like this. This is the narrowest line in the world at the time. So everybody was excited doing some tricks that would attract news media. Because at the time, you know, you, there is no application yet. You just want to get something in order for some news media uh, would pick up. And once again, exploded, the news media exploded with the new development that a scanning tunneling microscope or a sharp needle can move things around with precision of atomic precision, take them with atomic precision from their place, put them in another place with atomic precision, build devices. So this is an article, the first news medium, media report about nanotechnology came in March, 1992. And the, the British magazine, New Scientist, under the title, the smallest graffiti in the world, the smallest writing. Here's the cover of the, of the uh, magazine, piece I showed you, the Japanese. IBM people uh, put carbon monoxide the xenon forget because it's, although it came earlier, but it's, it has no value. But then they uh, did something at room temperature where each of these dots is a carbon monoxide and they drew something like a man or a human being. Here's from my lab where I drew a heart with the letter P for signifying heart for love, love, Palestine, love, Phyllis love, physics, whatever. Here's the molecular man. And here are some scratches from a CD, which we use uh, music. These are the music, the scratches. And the, uh, in Europe, they wrote Eureka. 
between them to show that they can do better than the normal procedure. And there are other examples. Uh, so that was a revolution, but revolutionary, but very, very slow nanotechnology. So this is the very first report of nanotechnology, but it's extremely slow. Uh, some people estimated that, yes, you can uh, uh, copy all uh, of the material in the Library of Congress on one CD using this procedure, code it, atom, put here, atom, put there, no, no, this, uh, but it will take forever. So it was practically not very good. Of course, we have to speed it up. So before I tell you about how we speed it up, I wanna tell you that nano already exists around the world in, even at that time, in my body. And so, you know, if you studied biology, Dr. Adnan is an expert in, in all these shapes and more, uh, then, uh, you know, anything less than a hundred nanometer of course, there are components in the human body larger than 100 nanometer, but we'll worry about the very smallest, which what we call nano, 100 nanometer. And you could see there are all sorts of proteins and uh, lipids and, and even the virus we are experiencing today is a, a, a nanometer object. Here is the RNA inside of it, and uh, the outside is the proteins which have the uh, needles or the uh, spikes that helps the, uh, the virus go inside. Here is an actual SCM picture. But I, I must tell you that this RNA, the DNA was not known before the 1950s, late 1950s at Harvard. But the RNA was not even known till the 1960s by somebody called Carl Ruiz. He's at the University of Illinois in chemistry department. His office was not too far from my office. He discovered it and he figured out how it works. Unfortunately, he died before, unfortunately or fortunately, he died before the corona visited us this particular corona, because there were other, the SARS is a corona, the one before, or even the pigs, as you used to call it. And, and in fact, if you look around at your hand and keep looking closer and closer with a microscope, you'll get to the DNA, which is a wire itself or the RNA. The thickness is nano, but it's very long. So it's already in the body. And so the idea uh, people turn to our body, start saying, how can we uh, learn from our body and produce those freely outside the body? Because if they are inside the body, they are useless, but uh, for this uh, manufacturing, so. Here is a nano in my laboratory. A nice picture. This is the globe. 19,000 kilometer across the diameter. If you miniaturize it by uh, 100 million, you get to the sucker ball. You miniaturize it by another 100 million, you reach almost one to two nanometer like this. And this is a particle which was this, uh, manufactured in my lab. And this is the subject of the many, many, many patents which are credited to me and my collaborators, including uh, Dr. Leila from uh, University of Jordan and Dr. Uh, uh, Hanan from uh, Yermouk and Saudi Arabia and different places. But this is the smallest, basically useful nanoparticle. And at this time, we define nanotechnology or the nano world uh, anything be uh, smaller than 100 nanometer down to one nanometer. So this is the region of the so-called nano world. Below that, it's very hard to get something. Well, maybe carbon uh, nano uh, uh, sphere, maybe about slightly less than 
one nanometer, but not by a whole lot. And uh, to show you that the human hair, if you ever, if you have any hair and pull one, you see the diameter, within a diameter, you have 100,000 of one nanometers. So if I want to stack this particle in a human hair, I would need 100,000 before I could go from one end to another diameter wise, because it's long. Actually, in my lab, we produce a family, familia of nanoparticles. The orange is silicon and the white is hydrogen. So this is a hydrogenated. Without the hydrogen, the particle would collapse and would lose all of its properties, the exciting new properties. And so we produce a family, uh, and here is a symbol. The smallest uh, radiates blue light under uh, dark light when you excite it. The next size green, the next size yellow, the next size is red. And there is more of the family, infrared, and they got in weaker. But these are the most important ones, those four, and they cover the visible, the rainbow. And so you could immediately start imagining what, how can you use silicon, remember the dullest material in the universe and suddenly becomes very bright with colorful uh, colors. So now we need to see how we can accelerate, we can make nanotechnology faster to get to the medical end, because you can't be staying forever if you want to solve the corona, you can't be uh, waiting forever. And so I'm going to call this the 21st century nanotechnology, basically taksim, watasghir, watasriya. And so we're going to take, instead of like what Feynman said, start one atom and, and, and move one atom, another, another, another. Now we're gonna start by a big object like uh, aluminum or uh, copper or silicon. It could any material, soft, bio, metal, or oxide, silicon, carbon, and starts uh, dividing. The, uh, the division is, depends on the material. So let's not worry about it now. Uh, you could use mechanical techniques, you could use chemical techniques, you could use all sorts of what, what have you, what, what is possible. You keep dividing till you lose sight of them, because in the beginning you'll see. But then if they become too small, you can't see them anymore. That's when you enter into the nanotechnology. But if you have devices, microscopes, uh, uh, light sensitive detectors and so on, you'll be surprised that we'll get novel new properties. Whether the thermal properties of the particle of the material change, uh, the mechanical, the optical, chemical, electric, bio, everything will change, surprise. And we cannot predict because it's a nonlinear phenomena. Now you see it, now you don't. So it's not linear. So I could say, oh, let me make it brighter. Oh, let me make it uh, the more mechanical uh, effect. No, you can't tell. You have to have a supercomputer in order to predict and go and simulate. Now, the third step is to make them smart. If we ever want to use them in bio, they have to be smart because they are like dust. So how do you make them smart? By make them interface with biology. You could put on them carboxyl acid. You could put them on them oxygen. You could put them a hydroxyl. You could put on them sulfur. You could put on them amine groups. Now you started to see how they work. Perhaps they could fool the body and, and do things inside the body. You could put on them polymers, you could all sorts of things. So the idea is that the surprise here is the following. The surprise is so exciting. That's why people are so excited because the new properties are the opposite of the old properties, completely the opposite. Meaning if you start with an inert material, like gold, 
or platinum, they become catalysts. They become highly, highly active chemical species, the opposite. If you start with dull materials like silicon, very dull, the dullest material, the, the, the darkest material in the universe, they become very bright, the antithesis. If they don't get affected by water, like magnesium, they become highly like a fuel, a hydrogen fuel uh, in water. You put them in water and they start bubbling like mad. In fact, Mitsubishi is producing, if you know the, the rocket which the Emirates used to get to Mars was made in, in Japan. And so they have a program, Mitsubishi, to produce magnesium powder in order to generate hydrogen in space to fuel the action. Uh, other, other effects like aluminum, if you grind aluminum, spars become more like dynamite. Aluminum, you cook with it on, on heat and stove, no problem, but it becomes di dynamite, the opposite. Materials that you can see through, that you can start seeing through, like copper, if you make them very small. Uh, objects that they're insulating for electricity, they, or, or, uh, they become uh, conductors, like in silicon. I don't know what that is. Then in the medical field, we have, they opened up new ways to identify biospecies, Raman from India. Raman, the Nobel laureates in, 19, in the 1930s, he established the concept of Raman spectroscopy, which is the vibrations of molecules and in relation to excitation with light use, uh, using the electron. So it's a combined electro and vibrations. And so you could improve on that and, and allows you to, to identify molecules. And this is very important for cancer. New ways to home in on disease, find out disease. New ways to kill cancer. We'll talk about those now. Ultra precise scissors for surgery, more protective ways of carrying drugs. Do you see these lines? I don't know what this, or I just see it. Do you, is, the, is the slide clear? Yeah, the slide is clear. Okay, it's on my clear. end, it's, it has a lot of junk on it. So now, Instead of building a house brick by brick or atom by atom like Feynman, we can build things particle by particle. That's a new concept, the 21st century concept. And in each particle, it could be a million atoms. So instead of taking one atom at a time, now I could have a million or I could have a billion or 100 or 30, depending on what you're trying to do. There are a lot of applications in all fields, electronics, clothing, sports, but there is the medical. That's the, that's the important one, which we want to focus on now. So how can uh, this nanotechnology help us in the biomedical field? There are a number of things. First, drug delivery. Uh, in therapeutic uh, techniques, diagnosis and imaging, making smart nano probes, surgery even, antimicrobial and preventive early detection and diagnosis of disease. First, how do we make a smart nano probe? You could take a nanoparticle like those which we described could be made of carbon, could be made of silicon, could be made of uh, metal or any other material. You design it according to what you're trying to do. 
you could have only a single one, or you could have a cluster of them wrapped with something. This could be a carbon nanotube, and this would be like a probe, a, a needle. So you could insert it in certain places. And so you could make these uh, nanoparticles attach to certain components in the human body, whether it's a cell or a DNA or a tissue, selectively. It means it goes to one, not the other, because now we have chemistry. You understand? Because we put on them carb carboxyl acids, we can put on them all sorts of things to make them smart. So they will only interact with a protein of this type or a molecule or that. So they are smart. So they could attach selective. Se secondly, you could put a drug on them. Once you figure out what you want to do, you could put a drug of them and put them there and release when you need. You could put on them devices so that you could measure the temperature locally because they're so tiny. They could measure the pH, they could measure the temperature, they could measure what molecules are there and send information for you, the molecular environment. They could take images for you and send them. Uh, and as I said, this could be a single one or a cluster. Here is, uh, in my lab, we do silicon. And uh, the silicon come in, as I said, in different colors, depending red, blue, green, and so on. And so that's what I focus on for several reasons. Here is my argument why silicon is good. Here is a, a prototype, the smallest particle. It has hydrogen on it. The moment you see hydrogen, then you know it's active chemi chemically because hydrogen bonding. It's not solid, even to start with, it has hydrogen, but I could remove the hydrogen and put on it carboxyl or anything else. First of all, you could attach an amine to it. You could attach carboxyl. You just need a chemist. If you are not in chemistry, they would help you out. They are very bright. You could measure a single one of them, light from a single one. We can see a single one. They, if you put them inside the body, they dissolve in the body fluid and they produce silicic acid. If you are into bio, you know silicic acid is very important component. It's necessary, its presence in muscles. Muscles don't work good unless they have a certain degree of silicic acid. It flushes, it rounds, it moves. It's, it's not like a, a particular shape, a spherical, and it goes through the ureter. We had a project with Northwestern where they injected some mouse and, try and tried to follow the nanoparticles and see where they concentrate in the ureter after they in the urine. They, they have soft chemistry. Hydrogen is not tightly, the hydrogen bond, silicon hydrogen, is, has a small binding, so soft chemistry. You could come in and remove the hydrogen without ruining the particle, without ruining silicon. And so, and you put whatever on it to your need. Why uh, medicine needs nano? Because I listed for you here, uh, different types of cells, and the pores on those cells are three microns, five microns, eight microns in the micron regime. And so you need something smaller than the micron regime to get inside the cell. So like a particle or a cluster of 50 nanometer or 20 nanometer, a 50 nanometer can enter most cells. So if you make your device 50 nanometer or you have to make it less than 50 nanometer, in order to do biology or, or medicine. If you want the, your nanoparticles to move inside uh, blood vessels, they have to be 20 nanometer or less. Okay, so that's where we come. Here is a breast cancer uh, image taken by Dr. Hanan Melkawi, and it shows the blue particle 
and you could see the 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 uh, the uh, cancer uh, cells are very rough. That's uh, that's a signature of cancer that the cells are very rough. Here is one example of how we can use this nanotechnology in biomedicine. You know, chemotherapy, they take uh, the, the, uh, the uh, poison basically in, an, in a syringe and they push it into someone's body and the syringe pushes this uh, chemical, the green dots. And here's the tumor, the waramia. And so uh, by luck, certain number of these chemicals would land on the or accumulate on the tumor and they start working on it. But unfortunately, they're already working on everything alive, on the leg, on the head, and, and uh, you kill a cancer, you create another one by these, because that's all chemistry is all about. The human body is made so that it will take one liquid only, water, can take even people drink alcohol, but it has some problems. It's not made for alcohol. It's not made for benzene. It's not made for uh, any other. It's only water. So now with nanotechnology, what you could do, you could do directed drug delivery. And so you push capsules, here's again, and the capsules, you make them smart. I'll show you how we make capsules and they land, you make them go, because you've already studied this tumor and you knew what molecules are uh, attached to it or made of, or uh, they, how do they signify themselves? And they land there. And when you are ready, you open the capsule and everything attacks the cancer and not the rest of the body. Here's how we make the cancer. This is a project with uh, Russia and Ankara uh, and Germany. We start with carbon, with calcium carbonate. You could buy this commercially, powder, or you could make it in the lab from an acid and a salt. You could make it in your own lab. We actually made it in our lab instead of buying it. The, this material is like the tabashir, the one we write with on the board. So powder, you incubate it in the nanoparticles, the red dots, so they go inside of it because it's porous. And the drug, these dark lines uh, are the drug of choice. So now you have included drug molecules and the nanoparticles within this sphere. Then you come and put the uh, polymer around it to wrap it, مثل الكبسولة, بحط عليها polymer, like that. This is your capsule. Then you put these in HCl, acid. What does the HCl do? It dissolves the calcium carbonate, produces carbon dioxide and calcium ions, and they go through the uh, uh, the polymer, because the polymer is very thin, and now you have a capsule with a drug inside of it and a nanoparticles inside of it. The nanoparticles here, the purpose of them is to see, because they produce light. And you could become very imaginative and you can put uh, the thicker uh, this, uh, you could put a layer of nanoparticles outside and inside and uh, double layers of uh, polymer. Yeah, you know, you could do all sorts of things. And <clears throat> you could now make it smart by putting things on the polymer, other uh, molecules that would attach to a certain molecule only, and you push it, and then you use ultrasound, you use a laser to break a hole in it, when you want. Here is an example of those where it shows that the nanoparticles surrounding it, imaging, here is where some nanoparticles are inside of the capsule. So this is uh, an experimental, is this already published, but it demonstrates. Here is another concept of how we use nanotechnology in 
solving some cancer problems. You know, everything dies in the human body at 50 degrees centigrade and above. Everything dies, not 49 degrees, not outside in, in Qatar and in Kuwait in the summer, 49 degrees is nothing in the, in the environment, but we're talking about inside the body. And so the cancer cells are hungry because they are like a child. They keep dividing, okay? The reason why older people don't get hungry because they're not any more growth, there are no division, they don't need a whole lot, just a little bit to sustain. But the cancer is like a new growth, so it's hungry. So we give it a sandwich. The sandwich, the bread is iron oxide. The meat is a gold nanoparticle or a gold rod or what have you. And since the cancer cells are so uh, hungry and so rough, I showed you the picture which Hanan took. They're rough. Their even pores are larger than the, the normal, the five or three nano uh, micron. So it fools it and it goes inside. While it's inside a tumor or a cancer cell, you shine infrared light. And so infrared light is like the one we get from the stove in winter. This will heat the gold nano through plasmonics. It pushes the electrons inside the gold and uh, it heats it. And when it heats it to 49 degrees, it kills the stuff around it. So this is how it works. This concept was uh, 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 figured out by Carl Bat at Cornell. So it kills uh, by using infrared. There's one, one major problem, which is uh, people don't like needles. And medicine will advance if we can get rid of needles. And so like the chemotherapy, oh, would be great if somebody goes for the, uh, the chemotherapy instead of being uh, hit by a needle, they give him a pill. He could take it at home. But there is a problem because most chemotherapy chemicals are large macromolecules. They're not small. They're not the normal ones. They are more effective when they are large, and I'll show you why in a minute. So if you swallow them, then the stomach will kill them because the stomach is acidic. It kills everything, almost. The liver metabolism would reject them. The in intestine will not uh, allow them to move freely. So you don't want to put them in the digestive part of the system they will be attacked. They will be altered, destroyed, or they reduce absorption. So now what you need to do is have a nanoparticle, would be better if it's a uh, luminescent so we can see, and you fold the molecule inside of it to the nano regime, and now you could swallow it as a pill. It goes through the stomach because you could fold it tight and it's small. The pores in the stomach are not big. So even a big molecule will not go out of the stomach. And so uh, then you could fool, and then maybe at that stage, you will become, you, you, we will have a breakthrough now, in a project with the women's section in King Saud University, there was a, a study which I was involved in for uh, the anti-breast cancer and anti-ovarian cancer chemotherapy. Here's a molecule which is used, big. You could estimate from counting how many bonds. This is the head of it, this has a tail. And we, we were planning to attach a silicon nanoparticle somewhere here. And how does this work in breast cancer and ovarian cancer? 
Within those cancers, there are tubes. Uh, there are uh, protein tubes made like that. And those protein tubes help the cancer cell, they bend. And when the cancer cell wants to uh, divide into two, then they bend accordingly and they divide it. And so what happens, this big molecule comes in and wraps around this tubing and makes it rigid. It has many spots. There is an OH here, there's an OH, OH. So there are many contacts where they would, like a snake uh, uh, whirling around a human body and then it can't now make it rigid. So this is how this molecule stops the uh, tubes from bending and stops the cancer cells from dividing. So you see, that there's a lot of physics, a lot of science, a lot of biology. It's not just, you know, throw in something and it works and kill. It's everything based on a concept in science and technology. And if you don't understand the science, if you don't understand the nano, you won't be able to design a thing. It's not just, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Another several concepts of how we can, we can kill cancer cells is the, some of the nanoparticles have a lot of electrons like the silicon nanoparticle because it's made so small and it has the, the, uh, the uh, half cell potential of it is, uh, has a lot of electronegativity, then it can zap the cells. Once it lands on a cancer cell, it can electrocute it. Another one, you could put uh, a carbon uh, particle and the carbon particle likes to take radicals. This is how the Eastern in China and Korea, they tell you, drink a lot of uh, green uh, uh, tea because the green tea has components that would take the radicals and make you live longer and, or by heating, as I described to you in a minute, in last if you could have aluminum or aluminum silicate particles that take water and so you dry the cell, you kill it by drying. Here's an example like the, the gold nanoparticle. You put the nanoparticles over a tumor, you shine some uh, infrared and you heat locally to 49 degrees, you kill it. And uh, hopefully uh, there would be no nanoparticles attached to the good part of the body because you made it smart. So smart is important. Here's how you could make surgery. Well, there's a lot of surgeries, uh, surgery tools, scissors, this, that already. But the idea how to make them more precise. And so you have to make them nano. And so you make a sharp needle and then you put a voltage on it. And that voltage would allow it to vibrate when you want. And so it vibrates, it cuts. Here is another one where you fill it with some liquid and it produces a jet. And when it gets to a cell that you don't like, you push a jet on it and you obliterate it. Here is, uh, this is like almost science fiction where you could uh, communicate with uh, a, a device that goes through the bloodstream and goes uh, to the, uh, to the tumor and you talk to it through uh, ultrasound and so on. And I already told you how we can use it to measure uh, pH and uh, temperature locally. But one technique of how do I put nanoparticles on components is uh, incubation. And this is used all, uh, so how do I put nanoparticles where I want? Either by a spray, mechanical, atomizer, uh, whether it's pushed, uh, this is like the one at home, people, uh, ladies use uh, for perfume, or you could put the cells you're interested in with the nanomaterial or with the drug in a cup 
and wait on them. They will just attach themselves. So there are several techniques. Here is uh, an actual sprayer. The uh, nanoparticles, of course, there's a lot of chemistry. So the, imagine I have an, a, a DNA, which I could buy from the commercial company, which has NH2 on it, amine. Then I could take a silicon nanoparticle, the R2, and could put on it in my lab uh, carboxyl acid, mix them together. Then the chemistry takes place water freezes out, and then you'll attach the silicon nanoparticles to the DNA through a nitrogen carbon bond like that. But believe me, this is very hard because the, there's a lot of competing processes that could take place and not get you to here. So you have a catalyst. So a group from uh, France, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris came to town and we teamed up people from biology, chemistry, material science, and physics, and uh, in order to do that. And here is the, the, the absorption of the nanoparticles read by themselves. Here is when they are on the DNA, you see this. And you're looking for this resonance and that resonance that tells you that you have a DNA. And so now, you have, you have, it's so intensive because then you could say, you're putting DNA with the nanomaterial. Some nanomaterial may not attach, you might have too much. Some uh, DNA may not, uh, may uh, hang around without anything attached to them. Of course, the component that they attach to each other is also there and small. So how do you separate? So you use uh, column analysis if you are into chemistry or biology page is called, you use butanol extraction, freezing, then you use gel filtration, then you use ethanol precipitation. It's tremendous, and you use absorption, and you use uh, luminescence for the particle, a million things in order to, so it's highly interdisciplinary. You need experts who understand this, this, that, of course, safety, a medical doctor, in case, all sorts of things. Here is uh, a uh, uh, cells, cancer cells from a uh, kidney. And kidney cells are uh, taken from a dog uh, at uh, Riley Children Hospital in collaboration. So we went there, a group of us from, uh, from U of I and went to India, Indianapolis. And kidney, you can see the kidney. They are very dark, so you have to shine a laser beam red laser beam in order to see them for scattering. And then you incubate them with the nanoparticles. The green is the nanoparticle. And you could see the nucleus. The dark the small spot is the nucleus. And you could use a, a device, a microscope. It's like a $1 million microscope where you send infrared laser and two photon excitation and you, and you could use the focusing inside the cells or outside. And the fact that you see the, the nucleus dark, it means the nanoparticles went inside the cell. They are not just outside. If they're just outside, there would be a color everywhere a green. But you could see that. So you, you could have sections, C-sections using the laser. Here's uh, the... Uh, the uh, uh, cancer cells of breast. Here is from uh, uh, bacteria. Those two were done by uh, uh, Hanan Mulkawi. Uh, here uh, a collaboration on how to use it for stem cells and growth of tissues. I don't want to give you a lecture on stem cells, but Simply, the stem cells are everywhere. Every organ has its own stem cells. Dogs are usually used, the closest to human being are the dogs. So you experiment on dogs, it's more applicable to, to people. Here is, uh, uh, we take 
at the vet school at, in Urbana, uh, stem cells from a muscle of a dog. And they have shapes like this, like the, the Egyptian eye, half of it. See the Egyptian eye, the blue and that, so it's very nice. And uh, stem cells, they could attach to each other and fill in uh, the damaged. They could turn to circular. They, they, they do all sorts of things because the human body is the smartest machine uh, on earth. And here is some of those cells that they attach to each other. So these two combine into one with two nuclei. This is the third one. Here they attach so many and make a, almost a, a tube. And then the, you, they stack against each other. They, they're very smart. So the idea is how to use them. And it turns out there are problems because you can't see what was going on. So what we need to do, what we did at the vet school, we loaded the nanoparticles inside the stem cells. Okay, so we can follow them and see what happens. And uh, so by incubation, so we took the stem cells from the dog, put them in a dish where we have the nanoparticles. The nanoparticles went in, and we investigated how to put more or less how to the effects of the nanoparticles on the, on the cells themselves. Maybe the, the, the stem cells will stop working if it has all this uh, wasakh or dust or nano solid inside of it. You have to investigate how the stem cells throw them out. Do they throw them out? How do they divide? When they divide, do we have the daughter ones? Do they have nanoparticles or they got stuck somewhere? All sorts of things. And here is a rabbit heart tissue that was damaged. And the uh, cells, the stem cells with nanoparticles were injected into the heart muscle. Here's an enlargement and you could see the nanoparticles sitting inside. And this is one stem cell, two, three, about four to five stem cells in this bunch. And different microscopes and fluorescence and, you know, this is, this is how you follow. Now, Raman, how can you tell if a cell is dead or a DNA is dead or a cancer is dead? The, the molecules which are present on, the, uh, on it, they give signature vibrations. And so uh, uh, the Raman uh, process, which was invented in, in, in India in the 30s, uh, uh, is very weak and very noisy. Uh, recently, they uh, did uh, this work as also Dr. Layla Abu Hassan. They did uh, some work where they could enhance the Raman by putting gold nanoparticles or aluminum or silver. But those heat, as, as you've seen with cancer, they could damage all sorts of things. Secondly, they produce an enhancement because the electric field around conductor is so high that that could itself overkill, it damages tissues, it damages the molecule you're trying to study. And so uh, this is not published yet, but about to be published from my lab, where we use the silicon nanoparticles as a softer material, still has the, uh, the, uh, the enhancement would allow us to say if there is a bond there or is gone. This concept was used by uh, Mustafa Sayed, my friend, who works on gold nanoparticles and cancer. And it shows that when the uh, vibration of a molecule is gone, it means uh, at least has good probability that the, uh, the, the uh, component has died. So it's very important to be able to tell that. Here is a demonstration in my lab, which shows the resolution. This is without the silicon nanoparticles. The resolution is very bad. You can't see any vibrations. Once you put the nanoparticles, then it kills the background and you enhances that. And uh, you could uh, 
play games. Uh, here's a new study we're trying to make with combining gold uh, and uh, silicon in order to get the best of both worlds. This is with uh, Arrokaishi from Oman. And this is a picture of his daughter. When he visited my lab, he saw all these colors and pink and nanoparticles. So he sent me recently a picture of his daughter uh, sitting in uh, Lourdes, uh, roses speaking in Oman. So I thought of showing it to you. You could use the, uh, the thing to the nanoparticles in order to for diabetes to look for sugar. And it turns out enzymes, of course, uh, they use to look for sugar, but uh, uh, you could also do it with silicon nanoparticles because when the sugar comes across the nanoparticles, the nanoparticles ionizes the sugar and produces a current. And that's why we call it empirometric enhanced response for the, uh, and you could build a device you could implant under the skin so tiny of silicon nanoparticles because they produce a current. And this one, Nature Magazine said the, 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 the sweet uh, sugar, because you're looking for sugar and this is a sweet solution. You could uh, try to use the nanoparticles to study masks, how they work for Corona. And this is done uh, in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, the group of, from Khalifa University, from uh, the University of Dubai, from, uh, uh, from a group from California and my lab. And we try to understand how the uh, mask, which Dr. Adnan was showing us his mask, here is an enlargement of what's going on and it's made of uh, hydrocarbon fibers like that randomly. Uh, and these are the white the nanoparticles and here's an image, fluorescent image. And we'll try to see how does it work. And it turns out the nano, the na so we studied the nanoparticles as a means, as a, as a means to study. Here's a mask where we use the sprayer to put the nanoparticles on it. And you do fluorescence microscopy to see the nature of how the nanoparticles stick to the mask. How does the virus stick? Well, the virus has a lot of proteins, you know, the spike protein, the amine groups, and the nanoparticles has hydrogen. So we studied that. So it's a lot of uh, detailed biochemistry, physics, in order to, to see what's, uh, what's going on. And here is if a nanoparticle attaches to this a virus, which has also antibi antibody attached to it, it could zap it with electricity, with electrons and kill it. There's all sorts of, uh, of tricks and novel innovations in uh, between them. Here's a very uh, picture where I wore a, the, a mask, which is shmag or kofiya, and uh, Luckily, it has this pattern, and uh, it was a hit in the News Gazette. There was a, a program to show uh, different techniques and, and how the filter works. You could even, uh, on a lighter note, you could even put the nanoparticles on uh, skincare uh, products, since we are in healthcare, and uh, you could put it on uh, skin oil. Skin oil is more on the blue side. Uh, nanoparticles on the red, so when they put them together, they produce white, uh, and uh, you could put it on the human body. And here's the spectra of how you add the skin oil, the the, the green, and then the uh, the uh, nanoparticles give you this red. And depending on the ratio, you could produce all sort of uh, colors white. Here's a foundation cream. The ladies know that they put it before they put the actual cosmetic. And uh, we are all having a problems with hair and we're trying to solve the problem in hair and with a group from uh, Russia, from uh, Ma Marina Maximenko and the lady uh, Halawani from NRC Cairo. Uh, we try to put the nanoparticles on hair. And then if you look at it carefully, here it is. You see the nanoparticles mostly uh, try. They go. They are everywhere, but they go at the cracks 
that were uh, damages and sit in them and uh, through this uh, sunlight and charge uh, they can fix the broken hair uh, of course nowadays uh, medicine has is trying to advance even beyond uh, traditional so now we the, you might have heard about uh, the treatment uh, genetic treatments the like you take two people each have uh, a, a liver cancer and you think they are the same but they're not the same the cancer expresses itself in one person different than another and there are multi-billion uh, uh, effort in the united states to to study different types of cancer in different people and so you analyze for the molecule that the certain cancer on a certain person and you design a nanomaterial or a medicine that would only attack that molecule. So it might be different treatment for two people with the same disease, but of course the, the micro details of the disease are different, but overall it looks the same. So that's what the personalized uh, medicine. Quickly, uh, who are the sick? holders or shareholders of the uh, medicine. Everyone, you, you must have gotten my picture, my story. You need a pharmacy, you need a biologist, physicist, chemist, uh, biophysics, medicine, material science, engineering. You need the, the people who are having problems, the community. You need industry to build devices. You need manufacturers. You need the, the new tools, the healthcare personnel, uh, you need venture people, money, money, a lot of money. You need the government which regulates authorities. You need policy makers. You need the government. So it's everywhere. And everyone brings what's their inventions. And we call it open innovation. Everybody contributes what they've got from innovation. But the problem with nanotechnology and medicine is that it's very hard to make identical uh, nanoparticles or identical uh, the, uh, re with repeatability and the cost. And of course, the safety. You don't want to swallow things which could make things worse. And it's highly interdisciplinary, as I said, the highest interdisciplinary in the world. Because as the nano, everything goes chemistry, biology, uh, electronics, uh, the, the, the kids even, we said they are interested in this. So everything, computer intensive, IP rights. You have to have uh, patents. You have to have freedom to operate. You have to have integrated stakeholders, everything. And you have to teach because we discovered many doctors are unaware of nanotechnology. Doctors by themselves, they, 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 they take uh, physics 101 and that's it. You could see they were chemistry 101 and gone. A lot of chemistry, a lot of physics, a lot of electronics, a lot, a lot, a lot. And if they don't speak the same language, we don't get any. That's why you see the medical people are not into it as much as the bio or the scientists. We need to get students to get uh, into science uh, fields. You need the public, the, the people who've got the money. The, 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 I, I actually use short stories to help. Here was a, a symposium at Karachi University where, where I was a speaker. And we discovered that we need to encourage medical students to get into physics, physical sciences as a pre-med track not just biology. You can take physics and go. You can take uh, mechanical engineering and go to, to medicine. We need to get all the languages into the action. And you have to teach. You have to get people interested from the beginning, not at the end when they are just. Uh, and, and so we toured uh, schools here is in, in, in Ramallah, where Dr. Marwan Awartani, the minister, of education got me to get into inside schools themselves. Uh, and you could see the people, the kids are so interested. 
uh, in this business. And I really like to thank the uh, Ibtikar in Amman, Ibtikar Society, the, the, the Sayyida Suraya Ayad, who uh, ignited uh, children. And she collaborated with the University of Jordan and German University and uh, German Jordan University. And she promoted the short stories for kids. She's really got the kids going. And I wrote one story about Petra and, uh, and some med medical issues uh, with the Dead Sea and the, uh, the oil when, because the Dead Sea has some petroleum from a long time ago and people didn't know about it. And so it was causing diseases. And so I wrote a story along the, the, uh, the, the, the site of it is Kuwait where the, some sand and Saudi Arabia and even uh, the Silk Road in China, and here I am on a, their cup in China. Here is uh, in Margala Hills in Islamabad, where we took the issue, the, 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 three, the three of us, uh, uh, Dr. Arfan Ahmed from uh, Islamabad and Dr. Bulant Aydogan from uh, originally from Turkey and myself, and we toured Pakistan and this, uh, described what nanotechnology and how it helps uh, medicine and healthcare. And of course, uh, I am a subscriber to silicon because silicon is the backbone of the human life, from glass to clay, uh, dwelling, uh, houses, uh, computers, uh, you everything, and here is a, an an interview with the uh, the, the popular magazine, uh, the popular mechanics, under the title "One O Nine Ways of Silicon Complete Completely Rules Every Part of Your Life," and I said that uh, it's silicon is amenable to all sort of changes in the environment and in the lab, and that's why it's so rich. And I will end with a couple of slides, which is uh, saying that some applications have been achieved in nanotechnology. Uh, we did not talk about those, the mundane uh, applications in clothing, in sports, in this and that. We we're focusing on the, on the burning issues in medical and bio. Device applications are around the corner for solving disease. We're around the corner. The high risk, the risk is high and the challenges are not yet solved fully, but the payoff is astronomical. And it's never too late because to get into this field because discovery and innovation is available. Leadership at the world scene is at stake. Economical return is extremely high, but you've got to invest in leadership of the world. Can you imagine if you know you solve a problem in 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 disease, whether it's diabetes or or some ca you cannot get rid of cancer altogether, but you can make it softer. You can uh, help. And I, uh, education, as I said, not only to kids, but also to the older. I have a book on fundamentals, uh, applications of nanosilicon in fullerene and that. A lot of the stuff you heard are, are in this book. So I had one on electricity and magnetism. I have a book on optics in our time, uh, and a big article on nanotechnology in optics. And that took me to Al Hassan ibn al Haytham. And there is, I mentioned Al Hassan ibn al Haytham heavily in this, in this book. And I concluded that if Al Hassan ibn al Haytham was living nowadays, he would have gotten, or if the Nobel Prize was at the time, he would have gotten a Nobel Prize, or if they give it to the dead, that he would have gotten a Nobel Prize. And there is an upcoming book, uh, All in the Family, myself and Hassan and Ammar and Osama Naifi, with the four of us. Has written a book uh, which will come with Elsevier, a silicon metal system at the nanoscale very soon. 
And uh, this is an E and on a silicon for the end. And uh, my student, Dr. Yamani, Hassan Zain Yamani from uh, KFUPM and the Nano Center there, who studied in Urbana, my student. Uh, we've written uh, many articles together and he contributed to many patents. And here is one pattern uh, with oil Aramco, which we did not talk about energy, but that was covering an energy sector of how to use nanotechnology in enhancing oil recovery. Uh, this picture was taken during a visit of mine on, in, in Dahran. Uh, and, uh, and I end with Ramadan Kareem to you and your family. And uh, mashallah, the Eid is approaching very rapidly. And this picture is a memorable view from the top of Madrasat al Aytam it's for girls whom I visited and I lectured. And uh, it has, uh, when you get inside, you don't see nothing. When you get inside, you see three levels, al Hosh al Awwal, the middle one, and the top. And this picture was taken while well, I was on the top, and you could see uh, Kubba al Sakhra, it's like you are in the middle of it. And it's, it's so beautiful. And uh, we, I took with me some component and we demonstrated, and you could see the excitement among the young, nothing you've seen before. And, and you wouldn't know the excitement till you see the pictures. When I was in it, I was busy. But when I, they sent me the pictures and I see all eyes are focusing on the, on the stuff, I said, MashaAllah, this is the day when uh, the new generation will, will be much, much better than us. And thank you so much for your attention. And I'm sorry for the, uh, it took too much because it's early morning here in Urbana and I was very slow uh, in uh, taking off. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nafi. I would like to thank you again and again for this fruitful, enriching, and uh, excellent talk about nanotechnology. And before uh, I open the floor for discussion, I have two questions from uh, Dr. Adnan Badran and one from uh, Dr. Noor, Noor Bhatt. Dr. Adnan is saying that availability of fresh, healthy water is an integral part of health care. Has nanotechnology been introduced into more efficient membranes for reverse osmosis for desalination of sea waters? If yes, what is the current cost of producing one cubic meter of a fresh water using solar photovoltaic. The second question is related to skin disease and other medicine using nanotechnology and whether they are approved by FDA and about their safety. This is from Dr. Noor Bhatt. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, as far as the skin, let me start with the second one, the skin disease. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I had a patent and I had some studies on the use of nanoparticles in cosmetics, as you've seen. And uh, that took me, uh, that uh, landed me an invitation to go to Paris to visit with L'Oreal, headquarters in Paris because they are into cosmetics. And they have written a, a, um, a pattern of using my nanoparticles in, included them in their product. And while I was discussing with them, I was asking them, uh, did you do safety study? They said, we don't do any more safety study with, uh, with these. I said, why? So cosmetics has less stringent rules for using nanoparticles in them. 
I was I was completely surprised because it's not taken by the the mouth. It's not really or put. Uh, uh, so I was surprised, although the 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 uh, European Union has banned the use of uh, uh, metal nanoparticles uh, in uh, in, the, in in cosmetics. So this is under under study, under question whether uh, you need to do the studies uh, or you just go straight ahead as far as the skin is concerned. Because you know the skin is one of the toughest uh, parts of the body. Nothing goes through it. I mean, unless you have a major cut or something. That's why uh, you know you go to the garden or tamil uh, everything, and it's not like you're putting in your mouth. So I will follow this up because I have interest and hopefully uh, we will find out exactly. As far as the water is concerned, it's an excellent question because I remember uh, when uh, the King, uh, when um, Crown Prince Al Hassan came to Champaign, we had a water conference in Champaign because uh, we decided to have a, a conference in the water in the region in Champaign because some Arab countries cannot go to, uh, they had the previous one in Israel. And so when he, when he came, when, uh, when his uh, lecture was given, he, uh, it was said that uh, water is gonna be the reason for wars. It's not just oil or that, water is even more important. And so I appreciate Dr. Adnan's um, question. And uh, also, especially if it's combined with uh, uh, natural energy, sunlight, but I, I really am not into, I have not looked into the cost or, uh, uh, or the, the, the industrial, uh, uh, result at this time, but I will look into it. Inshallah, I will communicate with you, Dr. Adnan, if there is any breakthrough and or whether it's now competitive uh, or that. May I ask, Dr. Abdullah? Uh, you are uh, not, uh, you are unmuted, I think, yes. Yeah. We have Dr. Mansour, if you want to ask, oh, then okay. you will be the Right, yes, thank you. Um, I really just want to like the organizer for, you know, organizing uh, such a great, uh, you know, seminar, uh, uh, you know, and have the opportunity really to listen to a, a great distinguished uh, scientist like Professor Naifa. So really, I'd like to thank you very much for this beautiful talk. Uh, and also, you know, it, it was really an inspiration journey, um, you know, in how things developed over time. And uh, like, you know, hearing this, the whole things, uh, the whole journey and really open our eyes to, you know, to different fields of research and where we can, or, you know, where we can fit and uh, even start doing something. Um, I, I don't have really a question, just really want to appreciate this. Uh, and thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. That was a nice uh, comment and indeed, uh, you know, if we want to know how we can help ourselves in nanotechnology in the most burning area, which is uh, medicine. And rem we, let's remember that medicine is the hardest. You could uh, better breakthroughs in electronics and energy and uh, uh, photonics, but medicine will be the last because it has the safety, it has the human body, uh, the object is invisible inside. And so, yes, indeed, uh, it covers a lot of areas, but a breakthrough in one area would help another. And therefore, uh, for people who are into other fields, when they see advances in medicine, they should be happy, not only because, you know, medicine is dear to all, but also it can help uh, other areas, as you said. Thank you so much for your uh, Dr. Hanan, please. Yes. Uh, first, I would like really to thank uh, Dr. Munir. Uh, Dr. Munir is really, I consider him really as a golden standard in, in nanotechnology. 
And uh, I was really honored and proud that uh, he considered, you know, putting me in one of his research team in uh, early my career, you know, research uh, life. Uh, in fact, the, the, uh, the project that you already uh, mentioned or the publication about using nanoparticles on the masks, you know, that we put uh, for uh, the coronavirus, uh, you know, hopefully it will be away from us. Uh, did you use different types of masks like N95, the ordinary mask? And the other part of question also related to corona and, and nanoparticles or nanotechnology. Uh, have you had or you thought of any uh, doing any research uh, regarding the vaccines and, and the treatment drugs also for coronavirus or virus like, like RNA viruses? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Hanan. Uh, as far as the types of, uh, you know, the, the, the team is led by my son, Ammar, who's at uh, Mazdar and Khalifa nowadays. And uh, the masks used are uh, different ones. Mm -hmm. The regular masks, uh, so the picture you show, those yeah. are, which I have a bunch of them. And then the most advanced, the M95. The, the, uh, M95, uh, both types were used. There are some differences, but not a whole lot because the chemistry is different. There are some uh, compounds on them uh, uh, that that uh, that differ. As far as the solution, uh, you know the, the, that uh, uh, the the genius one is the RNA solution. The RNA solution, as I said, is a colleague of mine who figured out how the RNA works in the early sixties. And it came handy, although I understand uh, research was already going for almost 10 years. It's not like they started using the RNA right away. So they were ready for something like that. Uh, the only thing about uh, nanotechnology is that, uh, I mean, if you attach a nanoparticle just like cancer, if you attach a nanoparticle to one of those uh, viruses, it will zap it. Uh, just like we kill bacteria with, with silver. I think you and me discussed some silver yes. uh, nanomaterial some time ago. In the office. Yes. So that, but the problem with nanotechnology is that when you have a problem with global mass, there is not enough nanomaterial. Otherwise, the concept is there. The, the, you could solve the, the most advanced or the acute or the, the, the high-tech problems. But when it comes down to mass use, there isn't enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, Dr. Azar, please. My, my, my first question would be, you know, we have talked about the nanotechnologies and what they can do. Now things are moving also towards PICO technology. Can, mm -hmm. can you say anything about that? What's happening in the PICO technologies? Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, can I hear, hear you. me. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Hello? Hello? Dr. Hello? Uh, Hello? As far as, as, far as the... Uh, the, can, can uh, I, can, I, I can say it again. No, I hear I heard you, but I don't know if you're hearing me now. Do you hear me? I can hear, I can hear you. Okay. So nano, uh, I mean, the reason why uh, uh, nanotechnology in the nano regime is because, uh, you know, the solid, the, uh, uh, for example, in silicon, you need a unit of uh, tetrahedral, which means uh, several silicon atoms. And that brings you to the uh, many uh, several angstroms, which means you are in the nano regime. The atom itself 
is uh, has a diameter or a radius uh, around one angstrom, depending on uh, if it's hydrogen or uh, uh, uranium would be smaller even. And so once you get into the PICO, you get out of the uh, traditional material nanotechnology, let's call it. You might get into another realm, which is uh, maybe uh, uh, electromagnetic, uh, maybe light if you get to the femto. But the material nanotechnology where we use it like as a material, it will have to be larger than one atom. And one atom, maybe more or less, uh, you can do, uh, although there are devices made by one atom, but these are even uh, much beyond uh, uh, technology uh, or uh, homely, homely technology where you could build a device and use it at home. So we're stuck with the nano regime. Yes, the reason I asked this question was when you talk about the nanotechnologies, we can treat with classical physics, if you like. But when you go to nanotechnology, you have to do the quantum mechanics with their, with their complications. And of course, in our bodies, there are systems or particles or, or bits which are also treated quantum mechanically. So there must be, must be pico technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, of course, uh, money, I mean, the theories used, you have to use uh, quantum Monte Carlo, uh, the, 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 those kind of uh, techniques. You have to put, especially at the nano regime, then you might have to do uh, uh, many body quantum uh, analysis. But unfortunately, and that puts some limit on even uh, how large the nanoparticle the, on the other side, on the other extreme. To use uh, quantum Monte Carlo, uh, maybe with the new computers, the quantum computer, we could do things larger using quantum mechanics. But now, like one nanometer, the one I have, the particle I have, is the limit for uh, many body uh, quantum uh, simulations. But as, as I say, PICO must be in the electromagnetic uh, regime, uh, not in the material regime. Of course, you might say uh, studying the, the structure of proton is a material thing, and it is uh, in the PICO, PICO yeah. But uh, wh whether we can uh, put a uh, proton to some applications like disease and that, I don't know or play games with it. But that's, that's maybe, I, I, when I had, I, I, uh, I was on uh, PTV, Pakistan TV, that's a live one. And the, uh, the uh, anchor was uh, so smart. And so when, when, when he was speaking to me behind the scenes, he was so soft and this, and when we started, he became on fire <laughs> on live. And so he asked me about science fiction. He said, I, then I said, never say no, because you never know what the future holds for you. New science, you don't take things lightly because who knows, we might be able to dig inside a, a, you know, a proton and put it to some a, you know, a mundane or everyday use, who knows? Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Hello. And unmute yourself, sir. Abdullah. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hello. Hello, please go ahead and ask your question. Are you talking to me? Yeah. Uh, I, I am Saeed Abtabit, a biology teacher and a graduate student in the University of Jordan. How are you? 
Fine, thank you. Also, I am the one who worked with the Dr. Nano on the story about Petra. Yes. I have a question, Doctor. Uh, this uh, Corona, there is so much uh, waste, medical waste, which makes a big crisis. It's not also, uh, it's not only contaminated with the coronavirus. We have the bacteria in the upper and the lower respiratory system. Do you have a nano solution for this problem? Or not yet, or it's not a danger yet? Yeah, I mean, uh, as, I, as, as we were saying that, you know, safety, in medicine is going to be the last application of nanotechnology in mass to get to the house, to get to the home, because of all these issues of safety. Uh, and so there are, I mean, it looks like it's possible for nanotechnology to attack the yes. virus. No, no doubt about it, because uh, you know metal or silver or that uh, they, they are already used in hygiene and killing bacteria. Uh, but just getting them inside the body would require a lot, a, a lot of studies. Not only studies by the scientists, but studies by the regulatory. They have to observe everything, and you have to. Uh, use uh, maybe animal and then use uh, uh, people and then accumulate a lot of data. So that is what is holding nanotechnology. It's not the short of, uh, of uh, scientists who are interested, but also I think, I think nanotechnology is so scientific and technological oriented and unfortunately, medicine is not. I mean, you could have uh, children, uh, the, a, ped a pediatrician is not into any of these uh, topics. The most they studied one physics class, one chemistry class, I mean, not much. And uh, till we get branches where people Medical doctors are taking the the. Uh, I I we have the a program here at the University of Illinois and, and three or four other universities, which is called Scholar Program, where people make a PhD in medicine, and PhD in another discipline, mechanical engineering, physics, chemistry. Those are the people who really can make nano in medicine ignite and solve many of the problems. But so far the medical doctors, present ones, they are, you know, they, they have too much work on their hand on medicine. So thank you so much. And I thank you for what you're doing to the, uh, to the uh, story and promoting and getting it to the, to the reader. Uh, that's the that story, which I, uh, uh, also, it turns out it's on the anniversary, the 100 year anniversary of Jordan and Petra uh, is, is at the core of Jordan. Dr. Leila, please. Dr. Leila. Shukran, shukran. Yatikum al afia, yani, daim an kal mu'atad, talk mumtaze. Very informative, and thank you to Dr. Abdullah and the organizers, and we'll see all of them, and all of them, and the friends. I want to ask Dr. Munir after this long and we're going to start in 1992, at the beginning of the work, the partnership, meaning on the level of the level. I want to ask about the situation of the Urdun. من ابتدأت النانو تكنولوجي وكان في تيك اوف بسيليكون نانو بارتيكلز وبعد ذلك انتقلنا لمرحلة التعريف بالموضوع ومن خلال ديفرنت ووركشوبس في الجامعات في كان جهد مشترك يمكن وكنت كثير دائما مبادر دكتور نايفة و 
كنا متعاونين فيه جدا وفي المنطقة كان يصعب نجد حدا ابتدأ بالعمل مش بس بالأردن يعني في بمعرفتك الآن وعلاقاتك البحثية مع الأطراف المختلفة ومراكز النانو تكنولوجي المختلفة اللي الآن تشكلت في المنطقة ككل هل في تعليق على هذا الجانب؟ يعني وين الأردن؟ هل إحنا ما زلنا على نفس السوية اللي كنا فيها سابقاً؟ هل وين أي التعليق اللي ممكن يساعد بوجود الوجوه كمان اللي إلها علاقة بالديسيجن ميكينج؟ شكراً. دكتور ليلى، could you summarize what you said small in English so for the benefit of others؟ شور. We have started the journey with Professor Naife since. 1992 and since then we've been working aside from the uh, research work for silicon uh, and the applications etc whether in jordan we we started a program of popularization of specifically the nanotechnology in jordan in specific and in the arab world and in the islamic world through the icisco and uh, through direct uh, workshops uh, held with our uh, in uh, AUB or uh, in Dubai or meetings uh, funded by uh, the NSF or a conference funded by the NSF in Jordan as well and others. When we started the work, it was hard to find anybody working in nanotechnology, not only in Jordan, in the whole region, but now, as Professor Naife uh, has part and has uh, strong uh, relations with the, with the nanotechnology centers in the whole region, or in most of it at least, I'm asking about our position at this time, the current position of yeah. ourselves in Jordan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Layla. Uh, Dr. Layla and uh, I, she's uh, visited uh, and she came to University of Illinois many, many times. And of course, has uh, used to travel uh, heavily and uh, she would, uh, I would uh, give her the, uh, the uh, task of uh, supervising my students. And sometimes even when I'm in town, I, if somebody asks me something, I tell, go ask Dr. Layla because they may not listen to me, but they listen to her because I tell her, you know, uh, toughness is not, uh, uh, is not always bad because it's, it's, it can get things done. And so we collaborated on many areas uh, through uh, writing articles, doing the research, uh, holding conferences. Even uh, she uh, was on the organization of the Arab scientists of technologists abroad where we brought the first meeting to Jordan. Going back to uh, the, uh, indeed, uh, the, the very first uh, I, 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 I uh, delivered a, uh, a talk in Qatar uh, organized by UNESCO on the ethics of nanotechnology. Uh, that was several years back. And I made a study at the time, the, uh, the situation in the Arab world and Muslim world as far as nanotechnology is concerned. Jordan was a leader in that uh, uh, time uh, I divided uh, the, the Arab countries or the Muslim countries on people who are actually doing things, people who are uh, uh, just in newspapers uh, talking about it, people who are just looking and thinking, should I go in or not? As far as you know, the, the country as a whole. And Jordan was one of the first countries that thought about uh, the national, a national initiative. Uh, on nanotechnology, where there would be commitment from the government and uh, with the, the amount of funding and uh, so that people would would not have to sweat and know what's where to go to get some funding. And uh, and then with uh, with uh, with time, 
uh, maybe uh, five years ago or something, I wrote an article uh, for Muslim science. And I summarized uh, I, uh, the, the uh, nanotechnology and I was surprised that there was more now. Malaysia is moving very strongly experimentally. Iran, I attended the world uh, meeting, uh, world uh, exhibits, several of them in Japan and the only Muslim country in the region was uh, having a booth and with uh, tools and with manufacturing and that was Iran from the region. And so uh, Turkey was uh, trying to get in and I visited Turkey and we uh, met with children and, and I, you must have seen a pictures in my talk about Iskandaron. But, you know, translating interest and energy into real action is another thing. And so although Jordan may have started earlier than all countries, but somehow the lack of resources and, uh, and uh, funds for a good reason, because Jordan does not have the major resources. Uh, now in 19, uh, the, the uh, structurally in 19, in 2005, 2006, Saudi Arabia got a national initiative and King Abdullah, whom you must have seen also some images of him in my talk, with that we didn't have time to, to focus on it. He actually started in 2006, the program of nano centers. And so he contributed funds from his own and of course uh, got the Ministry of Higher Education and the Wazarat al maliyya and the Jamaat to, to invest more. And so he started a revolution in nanotechnology in, in Saudi Arabia. And Dr. Zain Yamani, whom you know, uh, is a collaborator with both of us. And he, uh, you saw him in Urbana and in various places. He is a leading figure in nanotechnology. So I do hope the Crown Prince Al Hassan was extremely interested in nanotechnology and he's always advocating uh, to uh, uh, start a center. Uh, but the, in Jordan, it's still Amal Mubafar, yani people working on their own, and uh, which is good, but uh, uh, Jordan would be on the map <clears throat> much more visibly if they uh, build these things together and make a cohesive program. In Pakistan too, there is, uh, uh, in my, on my visit there, we discussed the situation in Pakistan in, in, in nanotechnology. Uh, there's a lot of research and a lot of experts, but again, everybody is, is doing their own. I make a comment. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, congratulations uh, to Professor Naifi for uh, uh, raising this voice again on nanotechnology. Uh, our own interest in Pakistan goes back to 1995 when I, for the first time, gave a lecture on biomaterials and used the word nanotechnology in Pakistan. Since then, there is constant interest, but as there are difficulties of the funding. But anyway, uh, the first... Uh, uh, paper which we published in the Proceedings of the Islamic Academy of Sciences was in 2002 uh, in a conference which was held in Pakistan and I arranged a specialist from China to talk about the nano devices at the time. Um, and overall view, I gave two papers on this, uh, which I published, uh, Mr. Munif is uh, listening to it. Uh, currently, uh, I can view that um, in, in the year 2003, there was a National Commission on Nanoscience and Technology from the Ministry of Science and Technology in Pakistan, which I was heading for five years. And in that, there was a national attempt to um, fund uh, five projects on nanotechnology uh, in Pakistan, uh, in, the, in the medicine field, in biotechnology, in the 
uh, industrial, there is some uh, difficulties I addressed to the Chambers of Commerce in Pakistan some 10 years ago for uh, industrial applications in, uh, in uh, textiles and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing which I find is really um, uh, the industrialists coming up into, uh, into this field, which is heavily uh, and is very important because they're trillion our industry at global level. And I think our Islamic countries should concentrate on it. And next particular seminar may be arranged by this on the industrial application suited to the countries of OIC. Uh, last, my last comment is about the medicine. For the last four or five years, I'm interested in the nanomedicine uh, aspect of the nanotechnology. And uh, uh, there are a lot of applications in, in, in vivo in, uh, in the resolution of MRI in the in the prostate, and, and some, but the important point is the uh, health effects and the side effects of the nanoparticles when you use in the medicine, as I put in the question. Uh, one last comment, which I think uh, for the attraction of uh, uh, medical doctors uh, we are trying is uh, to introduce a course of uh, 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 nanotechnology and nanomedicine in the study of undergraduates of medical students. Because uh, as Professor Naif has said, it's difficult to get the doctors uh, into it, although uh, during the past 10 years, uh, we have in Pakistan held two seminars uh, in combination with the doctors on nanomedicine. They show the interest, but as they are heavily loaded with the clinical things, uh, it's difficult to give them the time for this. But I think uh, one way uh, now I'm trying to have it is to introduce uh, a, a nanotechnology and nanomedicine uh, course in the undergraduate studies when they are doing five year study of MBBS, Masters of Bachelor in Medicine, Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. And by four months, they, these young students study the a course of uh, nanotechnology basics and nano uh, medicine applications, which are available now on literature. Uh, they will be forced to, uh, in years to come, to get, uh, mo do more research in nanomedicine. This is my new suggestion, and we are working on it. Uh, your comments, if, uh, if you, I would be uh, very much uh, pleased if you can give your comments on this aspect of education, nano education for the medical students. Thank you. Thank you. This beautiful, beautiful comments. Yes, I, uh, I, uh, the, the uh, workshop was uh, between the University of Illinois and uh, Karachi uh, University, it was uh, funded by USAID. I was the keynote uh, speaker at that. It was on nanomedicine. And that place is really heavy on, on, on medicine uh, in, 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 in Karachi. And I visited Comsat in Islamabad. And uh, also, uh, I find that uh, there is a lot of action. Uh, I appreciate your interest in education and in designing courses because I really think if we can educate or not educate, uh, the, the, I mean, uh, make it a program a, a, a required for medical students or medical doctors to know more about the physical fields, more advanced courses, and uh, that they would take off with this nanomedicine. Uh, and I appreciate your effort because that's really what, what it takes. There was an article in the slides, which I showed during my visit to, to Islamabad and the newspaper, which discusses at the time I was into it, I was looking into statistics when they were asking me and I was prepared with the details of the various universities in Pakistan, what's going on. It might be useful to, if you have a chance to look at, uh, and the problem with funding and the problem with uh, uh, emphasis and education, indeed. Uh, just one last comment about, uh, I, I unfortunately missed, People uh, are in contact with me. I was in uh, a nanomedicine, uh, in fact, molecular medicine seminar in Karachi. But uh, we are welcome. Uh, oh, you were there? Yeah, I was in 2006, not later. I yeah. missed a little. <laughs> but yes. there was the Iqbal Chaudhry and Atar Rahman Center. I'm fully in contact. Yes, yes. Uh, I should mention Atar Rahman. He is really, uh, you know, has a lot of energy and. and 
you saw his his photo in the uh, anniversary of the Islamic meeting in Qatar. He was on that picture. I, uh, he's a good friend of mine, and I also appreciate all of his effort in advancing science and technology in Pakistan. In fact, uh, in fact, in, uh, in 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 2003, he was the Minister of Science and Technology, and he formed the Nano National Commission on Nano Science and Technology, for which I worked for five years as chairman mm -hmm. of. It. You know, it started. So he's a great supporter of this. Uh, this yes, technology. yes. Now we we give the floor to to Dr. Sara Ghazan. Sara, are you there? Yes. Um, yeah, go ahead, please. Assalamu alaikum all. I'm a student at the University of Jordan studying chemistry. Well, I have. Um, I mean, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I have fundamental question that what happened to material states after divided to smaller uh, sp uh, sp species? Uh, it's keep uh, it's become liquid due to coating with polymer. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I did not hear the whole question, but I I, I got the part where uh, you divide and becomes a liquid. Gold, for example, becomes very soft. Be, you know, it's solid. Of course, gold is not the hardest material even when it is uh, solid. But as you subdivide and you reach the nano, uh, it could come as droplets. And that was shown from um, IBM work where they uh, were, um, dropping some uh, nano uh, gold from a tip and it looks like as if like they're dropping liquid so it becomes more uh, softer let's say the binding between the atoms uh, becomes less and less and less so all sorts of new novel phenomena which is the opposite of what you start with and that's the beauty of nanotechnology. If I want the group to, to take from this meeting is the fact that the new properties, the novel properties are the antithesis of the original. That's why they were not there in this beyond nature and it, it challenges our concept of engineering. And, uh, and the whole thing about nanotechnology how can we become smart to utilize these new materials? Think of new applications and let go with our imagination to harness these additional properties. Is that, is that what you were asking? And, and uh, can, can you add more if you... No, thank you, Victor. Okay. You. If there is no more questions. Can I have a comment, Dr. Abdullah? Yeah, go ahead, please, Dr. Dia. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Munir, uh, for your informative uh, talk. In fact, uh, you have already mentioned the Jordanian scientists and technologists abroad. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, you've been actually one of the pioneers in, in that uh, project. Um, uh, we think of uh, right now of uh, reinitiating the, the whole uh, project and trying to uh, just to move things forward uh, within that. And I hope uh, you can uh, really have a big uh, momentum uh, in bringing that uh, into uh, perspectives. Uh, in fact, I should also mention that uh, the King Abdullah II, the, the, uh, the National Center for King Abdullah II for nanotechnology has been also reinitiated uh, with the with the in cooperation with the Royal Scientific Society. So perhaps I think we can really build the the the, the stepping stones uh, for uh, such a center in order to promote uh, nanotechnology within Jordan, and hopefully that uh, we will be really on the edge of uh, research and technology within that uh, center. Thank you once again. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dia. Yes, I, I saw the center at uh, Yarmouk and uh, the talk about the Jordan one at the University of Jordan. But I think this concept 
of having one for the country, because you know where uh, it's hard to collaborate between universities and everyone is in their own bubble and, and stuff, but having this, uh, which also was mentioned to me by Dr. Adnan Badran uh, uh, last time we had a webinar on another topic, is very important to have one that doesn't belong to any and anybody can come from different parts of the country and use and utilize and, and it's open for all and even for outsiders would be uh, a way to integrate all the uh, resources human funding, this and that, and put back Jordan on the map the way it was, it was supposed to be from the early 1990s when it was the leader in the Arab and Muslim world. But, you know, uh, this is the way it goes. You have to have uh, rich countries can afford that, but uh, uh, although nanotechnology is not an expensive, a highly expensive field, there are some aspects of it very expensive if you're talking about chips and making advanced devices, but there are certain part of it is low cost. You, you know, you have to use your chemistry, you have to use uh, small things. And, uh, you know, they, it's like what the saying say, you start with what you can and then uh, waiting to take off uh, when other people buy your, the, the idea and put additional funding. Thank you, Dr. Dia. I appreciate that uh, update. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Doctor, uh, Dr. Norbat, you want to, to talk? Just a very quick comment. About you are muted, Dr. Bhatt. Dr. Bhatt, you are muted. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Is it okay now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Initiative of uh, undergraduate degree in nanoscience and technology, nanotechnology. This is a, uh, a 10 years experience which has proved very useful. And very briefly, this degree contains four subjects at advanced level in teaching, physics, chemistry, biology, material science, and of course, uh, um, biochemistry and so on. So at advanced level. And the advantage we have found in the last 10 years of this multidisciplinary degree is that our, uh, more than 70% of our students have been able to get uh, scholarships for MS leading to PhD in Germany, in Hong Kong, in Russia, in seven countries. And they, and, and they have variety of uh, uh, research PhD is going, somebody doing cancer research, somebody doing research in solar energy, somebody uh, doing research in advanced materials, somebody, you know, because they are given four subjects at advanced level in 132 credit hours. And this is our 10 years experience because we talk only when we have produced something. And uh, uh, the scheme of studies, uh, the important point is, and the difficulty is to having four professors uh, under one control. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, at the five uh, to have uh, six professors in these fields at one department controlled by one person. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, happy to, uh, to have this. Uh, and 10 years uh, results have come up uh, very effectively. And I would suggest that our OIC countries should consider it. And uh, if they are welcome to uh, come to our university, it's a private university. The fees are not very high, living is okay. And, but the utility of this multidisciplinary degree has been found internationally uh, fairly high. The Institute is a, a Preston Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, and uh, I can send the scheme of studies of 132 credit hours and uh, the subjects of quantum physics, uh, biochemistry, nanotechnology, biotechnology, nanochemistry, and so on. The yeah. professors are fortunately available, very experienced professors. Thank you very much. I just wanted to offer uh, this uh, this courses uh, if uh, some of the uh, our friendly countries are uh, interested in this in, in in this degree thank you very much yes it would be nice to make it available to the to the academy at least uh, so that uh, you know uh, they can distribute to the all members to see what's available and and build on it instead of uh, everybody starts their own and uh, start from scratch appreciate your uh, informing us. Yeah. 
Dr. Bhatt, you can send us a message about this so we can circulate it to the different Islamic countries. Okay, thank you very much. I'll send in, in your newsletter also some write-up of the actual... Yeah, exactly. That's, that's really good. Thank you. Uh, at the end of this uh, excellent and enlightening uh, webinar, I would like really to thank again uh, Dr. Munir Nafi for uh, his contribution, which seemingly very, very appreciated by the participants. And I would like to thank all participants for their interaction within the course of the webinar. Thank you again. Uh, have a good day. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak and Eid Mubarak, inshallah. Eid Mubarak. Inshallah, uh, we'll see you next webinar. Inshallah. Uh, thank you very much for your presence. Thank you. Kul'awwan tum bikhair wa shukran Dr.